district and our sister institution of higher learning, Jackson State University, JMC, was developed to create a grow-your-own pipeline of certified and highly qualified mathematics educator for the district. This program identifies JPS students who have demonstrated a high mathematics aptitude to participate in a teacher development program which leads to earning college credits. Through this partnership, the university agrees to provide resources to facilitate the continuation of this program to yield students earning a bachelor's degree in mathematics education. Each year, the Middle College will seek to enroll 10 to 20 students during the pilot years, with 17 scholars enrolled during the current 2023-2024 school year. The Middle College will operate as a two-part program. In part one, the participants take non-dual credit coursework at their high school during part of the day and attend dual credit or dual enrollment courses at JSU for the remainder of the day until the completion of their prescribed coursework. In part two of the program, those MC scholars who graduate from high school and meet set criteria will have tuition waived or resources provided by JSU as they continue working toward the specified bachelor's degree. After graduation from high school, these students will continue as students with JSU working to earn an undergraduate degree in mathematics education. After which time, these students will contractually be obligated to return to the Jackson Public School District to serve as classroom teachers for a minimum of three years. How are we actually going to get these students back and forth from campus every day? Do they have a place to eat lunch? You know, all, all these things that we think are small, but these are the things that they have to deal with day in and day out in order to make a school run. So it's brought it back to the forefront for us as university professors. Yeah, it's not just about the curriculum, but now we're really looking at, you know, this whole picture and making sure we know how all this works. My name is Victoria Scantoberry, and I will be the coordinator for the program. I'm very, very excited to be working with the scholars uh, this year and help, um, helping out with the program. What I'm most excited about is us having the opportunity to develop a national model with JPS and JSU at the forefront, not just for the state of Mississippi, but being leaders in the nation. We want to send a message so very clear, not only in the sports arena, that you must meet JPS on the court, field of play, or band stands, but now also in the classroom. With a reputation like this, let the word get out that all roads lead to Jackson if you want to compete. I had the privilege of working with these scholars this summer with our summer camp, and I was blown away with their warm personalities, math abilities, and desire to give back to our community by attending this special program and agreeing to come back and teach in the wonderful Jackson Public Schools as a math teacher. It is an excellent opportunity for our juniors um, to be a part of this program. And I can only imagine during my high school days if I, if I was afforded the opportunity to have a full ride uh, two plus two uh, scholarship, tuition free, all paid. I can tell you that the seat that I'm in, we depend on math teachers at the K-12 level. We depend on them depend on them to prepare our students uh, for the next level. And I can tell you that I am looking forward to this project. As a former JPS math teacher, I'm excited to see these scholars pave the way as future math educators in the Jackson Public School District, the state of Mississippi, and across this country. Junior League of Jackson has partnered with JPS uh, for Backpack Buddies, is what we call this, or our school supply drive since 2004. So that's been 19 years. Um, and this, this project has a very special place in the hearts of our volunteers. And we love, you know, giving back, you know, to our youth and providing these much needed supplies to our students.
These book uh, backpacks are also going to support the students at Isabel, just as well as the students here at Marshall. So, um, yeah, so it, it, the support is needed until supplies last. So I'm encouraging parents to come on out and register their students so they can take advantage of this great opportunity. Jackson Public Schools is delighted to once again be here with Junior League of Jackson. They are amazing partners for us to provide our scholars and our educators with resources, volunteers, just the opportunity to strengthen all that the community offers to our schools so that scholars come in with no distractions and can focus on academic excellence. It's important, you know, to the community because for us, we want our community to thrive, you know, and that's why, you know, we are here. You know, our purpose is to improve the lives of those in our community, and that's why we're here, and that's, why, that's what drives us every day. Today we have Operation Warm Shoes sponsored by FedEx and they're coming to bring all of our pre-K through second grade scholars brand new shoes. They're sizing them for their current feet size um, and we're getting them walking away here with some school supplies and some happy um, that they can take home this evening. Today uh, we're partnered, FedEx Ground and, and FedEx Corporation, we're partnered with Operation Warm to provide uh, new shoes to the students here at Pecan Park Elementary. Uh, Operation Warm and FedEx have been working together for several years now, um, and this year in the, in the months of March and April, we're, we're giving away over 8,000 pairs of shoes to students in 28 different cities in North America, including Canada and, and Puerto Rico. It means that we are truly buying into our vision here at Pecan Park, which is educating a total child. So we're feeding into their social emotional well-being, making sure that our students are walking away with the confidence that they're needing to be successful, not just in school instructionally, but throughout life. One of our core values is commit to do good. And that's what we're striving to do is, is help build a strong, healthy relationship between FedEx and the communities where our employees work and live. And this is one way we can give back to the community. Jackson Public School District is successful and moving in one direction, featuring several special programs. The APAC program at Wells, Bailey, and Murrah provides accelerated coursework, visual, and performing arts training for scholars in 4th through 12th grades. Casey, a Blue Ribbon Elementary School, infuses the arts into every subject. The JPS Tougaloo Early College High School allows scholars to begin college in the 9th grade. The Career Development Center features 20 career and technical education programs. Our International Baccalaureate program begins at Obama, the number one elementary school in Mississippi, and continues through Northwest Middle and Jim Hill High School. McWillie's Montessori program is where students' interests come to life. REAP offers an accelerated pathway to graduation that re-engages undercredited scholars in 8th through 12th grades. The new Jackson Middle College, in partnership with Jackson State University, allows scholars interested in teaching math to attend college starting in the 11th grade. Applications open November 7th. Visit the JPS website for more information. Save the Music Foundation is so happy to be partnering with Jackson Public Schools, Jackson State University, and the Mississippi Orphanage. Good evening. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Is now called to order. Board members, we have four members present in the boardroom and one on the phone, Mr. Figures, uh, and um, therefore we have a quorum. Um, Mrs. Johnson is not able to be with us this evening, and Mrs. Thompson will be joining us by phone um, momentarily. We have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? Motion. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. 
We've all had an opportunity to review the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the August 15, 2023 regular board meeting minutes? I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Now we're on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. Uh, board members, we will con continue as we typically do or begin as we typically do with uh, some highlights from our instructional television team. As the first school week commences, Johnson Elementary receives a generous donation from Kroger and Byram, a powerful symbol of community support. Very, very critical to schools to have those types of partnerships within our schools to support the things that we're doing within the schools. When schools and community come together, it's always what's best for kids. Scholarly ambitions are complemented with essential supplies and over 500 snack packs. We want to make sure that we speak to them, talk to them, and work with the school administration to make sure that they are in school and that they're moving forward in their life to contribute to our community and to our city. As scholars return to classrooms at Lanier High School, Jackson Police extend a warm embrace, reinforcing their dedication to student success. Kids need to have positive interaction with law enforcement, and I told them, don't let this be the only time that you come. A JPS science and music teacher forms a student band called Heart to Soul as a way to positively influence his son's friends. They're never too young to start doing something. And it doesn't have to necessarily be music. It can be anything. Give them an opportunity to show you what it is that they are able to do. And now this soulful R&B sound comprised of JPS student band members entertains crowds across central Mississippi. We get to travel and go all over the city and see places that you won't usually see. Welcome to Delta It's the Citywide Day of Action and Fan Height Creative Group and Keep Jackson Beautiful. I wanted to coordinate to clean up this stretch of road of Percy B. Sampson here by Dawson Elementary. Let's clean it up. JPS scholars from Dawson Elementary and Capital City Alternative School join forces with community members to creatively clean up blight on a city street. Something to put over here to kind of deter people from dumping in the areas. Um, our goal is to beautify the space. Finding debris that's meaningful. Um, creating sculptural forms out of that, assembling that into forms, putting it onto these pallet walls that we constructed. We created barrier walls that we'll put alongside the road on this stretch nearest to the school. In a matter of a few hours, they paved a new way for students to get to school. The citywide day of action comes as an example about the possibility of an entire community coming together to keep the city of Jackson beautiful. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools and Instagram at JPS Student Voices and Twitter at JPS District, Fancast Channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at youtube.com slash JPSITV. As always, we want to thank the instructional television team for their work in bringing us updates from around JPS and all of the great things that so many people are doing throughout our district. Um, really great to see our young people engaged in some cleanup projects and uh, helping to take ownership of their space and, and of their city um, and demonstrating the leadership there as well. So excited to see that. So board members, uh, I really have uh, very few comments this evening, um, but want to focus them around uh, celebrating a few of our people. Uh, I've shared with you uh, that we had several schools with failing HVAC equipment uh, during the, the uh, August 15th board meeting. Also mentioned that it's getting harder and harder to find some of the uh, parts for our systems because they're outdated, they're beyond their useful lifespan. And so that's becoming harder. It's becoming harder to find people who will work on these uh, systems. But in spite of all of that, uh, our internal team members, our HVAC staff, 
Uh, it's small but mighty, <laughs> small in numbers. Uh, but they've been working, and they've been working, been working really hard, and they've been working overtime um, in early mornings, late in the evenings, and over the weekends to do their very best to keep up with our systems. And when they go down, and trust me, they go down pretty quickly and pretty frequently. And when those systems go down, our team members are there to restart them and, and do what needs to be done to try to get them back in working order. And while uh, if you've been watching the news, you probably have seen in other parts of the country where school systems, whether it's because of busing or because of the heat and um, you know just challenges with all of that, have had to close schools. We've had to do all sorts of things, moving kids around to different classrooms, and some have had to move to different schools. But um, for the most part, we've been able to keep our scholars in classes through this uh, record heat. And so uh, that's in no small part uh, due to our team members in the HVAC um, uh, facilities team. And so at this time, I'd like to invite Ms. Uh, Sandra Robinson to join us um, and introduce those team members and say a few more words about their Herculean efforts uh, to try to keep our schools running. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, I do want to give kudos to my team. It is a small team of only seven. All are not um, actually certified. We have four master um, climate control technicians in our department, one of which is our supervisor, Mr. Kenneth Johnson. So I would like him to stand here. He does a, a, a marvelous job. He was actually working on Labor, Labor Day, resetting the chiller at Kirksey. And so uh, he does. He leads by example. He just doesn't send his guys out. He he's out there working, doing the administrative part, but also doing the hands-on part. Um, I also would like to recognize Mr. Kirk Carthage, our maintenance director. And he takes the hits a lot of times when things are going well. When you know we don't always make those shifts like we need to. So I do really appreciate Mr. Carthage and Mr. Johnson, the rest of the team were not able to join us tonight, so I really appreciate them as far as putting together portable AC units when needed, but just everything that they have done in order to try to keep the staff and students in JPS comfortable during these extreme um, conditions. So thank you. I do want to again thank um, the team, all those, those who are here and those who couldn't be here with us this evening for all of their efforts. And I also want to thank our teachers and administrators and all of the other staff members in our schools and in some of our office buildings who've had to weather, um, no pun intended, but have had, had to deal with um, some of the, the heat conditions and our, our challenged systems. And of course, not to mention our scholars um, who remain focused on excellence. Um, with that, Dr. Sivak, I'm going to conclude my comments this evening. Great. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, and again, get, thank you for giving us the opportunity to recognize the, the um, team that has kept the air in the buildings. Um, I, I've heard, you know, we, we were in buildings and we, we've heard of just the, the overtime, the extra work, and it's, it's, it's you know, Ned, we can't thank you enough for what you've done. Um, and I, I did take pride because I've heard the reports of what's going on in different parts of the country when they said shift into virtual. and. Um, we know how hard it was when our students shifted to virtual and the fact that you all did the work to keep our students in school is something that we'll be grateful for for a very long time. So thank you for, for all of that. Um, so with that, um, we will move on with our agenda on to our public comments. I don't believe we have any public participation this evening. Um, I'll just remind uh, community members who would like to make public comments should email the request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting or appear in person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 on the day of the meeting. The board um, seriously takes into consideration comments that are shared. And of course, our, our board members can be reached at our email addresses, which are on the JPS website. Next, we have information items, and we'll invite Mrs. Robinson back up uh, to give us the update, the final update on our 2018 bond issue. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> 
Yes, this is a bittersweet moment, uh, Dr. Seebeck, board members, Dr. Green. How bitter is it, really? <laughs> it is. It's excitement and everything. So um, tonight we will have uh, show a few pictures of the baseball softball field, and we this is the last uh, bond update because we have expended that sixty-five million dollars. All right. Uh, then we're going to give some. Yeah, let's give a hand clap to that. Then we're going to uh, transition to Esser. Last week, we had the opportunity to do the substantial completion inspection at the baseball softball field. Yes. As you can see, the sink is installed. We have brass. Uh, we're just ready to start this facility. The contractor is still working on watering and doing some final touches, and it will be under their um, still direction for the next 30 days. And we're preparing with the athletics department, Dr. Jones, to, and we'll be contacting public engagement so we can schedule a ribbon cutting so we can see this facility um, with our parents, students, and just be excited with the community. So mission is accomplished. This is the last round update. Um, the uh, citizens of Jackson voted on $65 million to, that, that they entrusted us to expand. We've had, we have expended that $65, $65 million. We will be providing a detailed report by school as far as the, the, the projects that were completed at those schools and the funding that was expended at those schools. And so we'll have that um, coming um, short, shortly and provide that both to the board members and on the website. So as we transition to ESSER at the last board meeting, you voted on a project management services agreement with triage facility consultants. So uh, starting in October, um, Warren Bowen, the owner, will be providing those ESSER updates. And this is Warren Bowen. Hello. How are you all this evening? Appreciate you all having us the opportunity and uh, for, for being with you all doing this, uh, this ESSER project. Thank you. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Well, members, Dr. Harrison, please. I'm just about to jump out of my skin. <laughs> I'm so excited. I just want to thank you, uh, Ms. Robinson and uh, Ms. Franklin, who I don't think is here. She's not here tonight. Not here tonight. But y'all, you remember this bond issue. And we promised Jackson community that if they trusted us and passed the bond referendum, we would honor every promise and pledge we made. And I'm so proud of this team. We did it. We spent the money. We made incredible improvements across the district. And I learned so much and was so proud mm -hmm. watching Ms. Sandra Robinson and Ms. Franklin, two, two women who were ex excellent doing this work and executing this. I'm just so excited. I'm about to jump out of my skin. Thank you all. Thank you, Jackson, for trusting us in this work. And go visit some of these beautiful schools mm -hmm. that we have now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. I think we all are just really proud, excited, and all of that all of those things and thank you so much for the hard work all of the hard work that you all put into this mm -hmm. project you're here mm -hmm. yes we really appreciate that thank you i just want to throw in my two cents real quick miss robinson um we've had obviously a different um uh, uh i had a different participation in this because you and i met uh, with with the bond oversight committee separate yes. from this board um, and I just want to applaud the um, hard work the perseverance to get those projects done the creativity and the sort of uh, stick-to-itiveness that you all had to demonstrate um, I, I don't think a lot of people realize like when we pitch when the bond got voted in right there's this big list of projects and everything and there was a certain set of expectations that went, went along with it. Everything on earth changed in 2020, and, <laughs> and that includes cost of materials, availability of contractors, everything like that. And so for you all to be able to go through and to meet the expectations of the bond program, um, to get all these incredible projects, and I really do uh, just want to reiterate something that Dr. Harrison said, 
when you go in these schools and you see these changes, it's amazing. It's amazing work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know the kids feel that. I know we are proud of, of, of what you did. And I just want to say it was a lot harder than what you signed on for, and you still pulled it off. So um, I just applaud you for that. Thank and you your very much. Team. Yes. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just conclude and echo um, just just deep, deep gratitude. Um, you know, as, as a parent who's had children in spaces that were in desperate need of, of updating and upgrading, um, it's just a, an incredible feeling to see the, the new spaces, spaces that affirm our students, our scholars' dignity. Um, and so, um, again, I just am very, very um, grateful for the work that went into it, um, that, that, that we never gave up, um, that we completed the project, um, and that we did it all over the city. Um, there, there, you know, the, 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 we, we've made investments in parts of this city that haven't seen that level of investment in a very, very long time. Um, and I think it sends a strong message again to not just valuing the scholars and our families, but also the neighborhoods um, from, from, from where our scholars, our children live. And so, um, I, you know, uh, I am going to keep pressing for that report. Um, and also, Dr. Green, let's think of a, the public engagement strategy to, to celebrate and report this, this out. Um, there are a lot of people who helped us get this bond passed. Um, and we've got to set the table for the next one. I mean, that's, and, and I think the manner with which we demonstrate transparency and um, our fidelity to the plan will be an investment that will, again, um, bear fruit the next time the next board is, is here and, and needs to go to the public to ask for this money, because the reality is it was a fraction of what we needed. Um, so I, I look forward to that report, and I look forward to the strategy to, to, to calm strategy to, to celebrate the work um, and um, I'm sorry I missed your name <laughs> sir. Warren Bowen. Mr. Bowen. Mr. Bowen. Um, it's great to meet you. Um, there are a lot of eyes on the ESSER dollars <laughs> um, and so it's our job to interrogate the, the deployment of those dollars so we look forward to getting your reports and getting, um, getting to know you better as well. Yes sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Thank you. All right. Um, next, uh, we'll move on to um, an update on the investigation regarding testing irregularities. Um, and Dr. Green will present this information. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. As these slides are being pulled up for us, there we are. So, uh, board members, you'll recall um, that, obviously, you'll recall that uh, uh, we've been working to address some of the um, information that was shared with us through or by MDE, the Mississippi Department of Education, and so wanted to give you an update as to where we are today, what we found and what we've done. As a reminder, and always, we want to try and ground our conversations and our, um, our thinking, our decision making, and our core values. Uh, while all of these, I would say, all of these core values are at play as we talk about this issue, this matter, this concern, um, there are a few that I'd call out in particular. Um, one about excellence and our need to continually strive for excellence. For us as educators and um, those working on behalf of children and families, of course, for our children, um, our scholars, uh, for all of us. Uh, also, the core value of a growth mindset, which um, calls on us and challenges us to believe that our children can achieve, that they can grow, that they can uh, attain at really high levels, that they have the capacity to do so, and that we, as educators, have the capacity to get our scholars there. And so that growth mindset, I believe, is really important as we consider um, this matter. And then lastly, positive and respectful culture. It's really important that we create a culture and maintain a culture within our schools, our classrooms, and across our district and our community that uh, encourages people to be their best selves, rewards folks for being their best selves, 
and frankly and unfortunately at times that uh, addresses uh, when we don't present our best selves. So just wanted to call out those, those three in particular. So again, uh, just in, in the way of context and background uh, board members, we were contacted on Monday, August the 14th, which now seems like several months ago. But um, on the 14th of testing irregularities, uh, we were contacted by uh, and informed by the Mississippi Department of Education. And those testing irregularities occurred um, during the spring administration of the MAP assessment, the state assessment. Um, through the data that was shared with us, it was indicated that there were four schools that had um, more targeted and individual uh, abnormalities by a particular classroom or a particular subject or some students in a particular subject. And then that there were three other schools where uh, there were more significant ir irregularities flagged. We were directed at that time by the Mississippi Direct, uh, Department of Education to conduct an internal investigation and to submit a report to the Mississippi Department of Education by or before September 6th uh, of our findings in that investigation. And so we immediately uh, developed a plan and enlisted uh, some of our senior leaders in the district as well as some retirees who served as administrators and um, um, hearing officers and, and other positions for us to serve on that investigation team, just trying to um, uh, pull in folks who have the uh, background and experiences to kind of help us see what needs to be seen and make sense of it as we were going through the investigative process. Um, just went around all of the, uh, the issues that we've been investigating in not only uh, state uh, uh, policies or statutes, but also our JPS policy, policy GBA, which is a staff, staff ethics policy. And the first section here deals directly with um, operating truthfully as it uh, rates, relates to any investigation that's being conducted and participating in that um, truthfully and, and with honesty. And the second section speaks to falsification or altering or making false statements or misrepresenting um, information uh, regarding scholar records or testing, grades, report cards, test data, test scores, any of that sort of thing. As well, the Mississippi Educator Code of Ethics uh, 9.2b, which speaks to violating confidentiality agreements and specifically around uh, testing items and distributing those, publishing those, um, discussing those items, or um, in other ways violating um, state directions around uh, the use of tests. And so uh, what were our expectations of our investigative team? Um, we asked them to conduct interviews of scholars and staff and to record those responses. Um, there were uh, a number of us or, or a few of us on the executive team who actually conducted the interviews of our principals in the um, affected schools, impacted schools, as well as our district uh, test coordinator. And, and did the same, recorded those responses. We followed a script of questions that were developed for the various roles for our scholars, for, excuse me, for our teachers, for our uh, administrators, um, just depending on their role. And we followed those, but then we probed as appropriate, as needed, to try and get as much understanding of what was said or what was meant or any of that sort of thing. We summarized those findings, um, and uh, we asked the, the team to summarize those findings and, and uh, provide their reports, their summaries, to the deputy superintendent and general counsel, who really took the lead on uh, gathering that information, trying to make sense of it, and developing the report to be submitted to the Mississippi Department of Education. Um, 
The uh, investigative team was also asked to suggest any follow-up interviews. So we had a first round of interviews of all of the uh, folks that we thought um, would be able to shed some light on what did or didn't happen. Um, and then there were some follow-up interviews that were suggested as a result of what they heard or saw or didn't hear or didn't see um, in the first round. Um, obviously, we needed and asked them, expected them to maintain confidentiality and discretion. We actually had individuals to sign confidentiality agreements. Um, and then uh, we also asked the test coordinator to uh, compare the testing plans. The, each school develops its own testing plan with seating charts and schedules and all sorts of things for how they will engage in the uh, state testing program and to we we asked the district test coordinator to compare that information with the data provided by uh, MDE forensics um, before I go in I should should also name that um, in the interviews because there were so many scholars across the seven schools that were implicated uh, we ask that um, at least a third of the scholars be randomly selected to respond to the interviews. And so not every student who was flagged in the data from MDE, but uh, at least a third. And so we believe that that was a, a sufficient number to gain some insights. All right, and so, oops. So the Mississippi School Accountability Standards, that's the, um, it in includes Appendix F, which is, um, which provides for sort of the, the language of, of the types of violations that one might find in, in the, and that are most problematic in test um, administration. And so I wanna read that language. Um, and share that language with you. These are the types of things that unfortunately, through our investigation, we did find evidence of. And so, um, standard 16 violations in section eight, reproducing by any means or disclosing secure test material, including pilot material, and student responses before, during, or after test administration are prohibited. Reproduction or disclosure of secure test materials includes but is not limited to the following. Reviewing, reading, or looking at secure test material in a manner that is inconsistent with test security regulations and or procedures as outlined in the test administrator's manual. Use of unreleased test items in any form, including rewording of such test items, is strictly prohibited. So that's section eight. In section nine, the violations include coaching students, altering responses, or interfering with responses in any way during or after the scheduled test administration is prohibited. Coaching students is defined as providing answers by staff or other students to student stu or other students to students in any manner during the test, including cues, clues, hints, and or actual answers in any form, written, printed, verbal, or nonverbal, including but not limited to chalkboards, charts bulletin boards, posters, computers, hand signals, or allowing students to alter responses after the scheduled test administration. All of that has been laid out in those two sections in particular as violations of um, the assessment um, uh, program. Now I lifted up that language because um, these because um, this is this investigation, although we've conducted our internal investigation and we'll share this information with the Mississippi Department of Education for their further consideration and their further 
uh, review of, of these matters. There are further um, or additional uh, actions that the Mississippi Department of Education might take, um, including uh, reviewing licensure, suspension, revocation of licensure for any of the individuals as, as they see fit, or perhaps even uh, taking um, filing criminal charges as a result of this, because um, this does constitute um, a, a misdemeanor um, criminal activity. So I'm sharing this information because as we submit, and, and we did actually this afternoon, as we submitted our report to the Mississippi Department of Education, they then picked this up and continue their piece of this entire process. And so this remains um, a protected and a confidential process with regard to uh, staff and, and, and all of that. And so until they complete their portion of this work and their review of all that data and, and their uh, determination of any further steps that might need to be taken, um, we cannot make this report uh, public, unfortunately. As we looked at uh, all of the things that were um, listed in the, the previous two slides, those standard 16, section 8 and 9, those, um, those violations, and uh, compared that to what we saw and what we heard in terms of behaviors and, and, and um, actions taken by some of our team members, um, we tried to bucket them um, based on what we saw and heard. And so in some cases, there were flagrant, we believe, flagrant significant violations or even um, orchestrating or leading others in taking those violations. In some other cases, they were um, what we might call lesser offenses, still inappropriate, but not as egregious or as significant as um, the first bucket. And then. And then we believe that there are, from what we've seen and, and learned in our investigation, that there were those who, um, who, whose behavior was of concern to us but did not rise to the other levels. Um, and because this is an ongoing process, I won't get into who did what at what schools to identify any of that, um, but we saw um, most of what was described in the last two slides. So, so given that, um, there are, well, I'll, I'll also name this. And so, uh, given these three buckets, I'll say, of, of behavior, um, board members, we have, as of this afternoon, uh, indicated or uh, served notice to 17 team members that they are being terminated, three team members that they are being suspended, and there are 24 uh, team members who receive letters of reprimand. There are, as you might imagine, with that number of um, employees implicated in this, there are several implications across those seven schools. First, at Leicester, um, because of um, the staffing implications, our team has been working and is continuing to work with the leadership there to merge classrooms between the visiting Isabel scholars and teachers with Leicester Elementary um, um, school classrooms. You'll recall that Lester, uh, I'm sorry, that Isabel, some of the Isabel scholars are there while their building is being utilized by Jim Hill scholars and team members. And so um, this provides us an opportunity to absorb some classrooms, combine some classrooms, and still utilize the available staffing there and continue educating our scholars as we need to. At McLeod, um, we will look at opportunities to collapse classrooms, but we'll also be reassigning, have already begun reassigning some of our personnel 
um, from schools with smaller um, spaces uh, across the district or smaller enrollment sizes across the district to McLeod. This is, while it's meeting a, an urgent, imminent, current need, this is not um, something that's foreign to us. Every year we look at our enrollment um, and make a determination as to whether there are, is a need to shift our staff members. Um, and sometimes that happens, many times that happens within a school, but there are times that it also happens across schools where you've got lower enrollment at one school and don't necessarily need the four third grade teachers or the five um, English teachers, middle school teachers or what have you. And so that's what's happening at McLeod. At Peoples, however, the challenge is much greater. The number of, of uh, team members implicated here and, and um, staffing actions implicated there is such that we cannot continue to operate school at Peoples um, without making a major shift. And so um, very shortly, um, as an information action item, Dr. Cormack will come to you with our recommendation for consolidating uh, peoples with Witten Middle School in the Peoples Campus, which is um, which is in a newer building in far better shape than the Witten Building. Scholar implications. The impacted high school scholars at, at Lanier um, may be required by the Mississippi Department of Education to retest on the English II exam. Now this is not all of the um, high school scholars at, at Lanier. It is not all of them. Uh, but for those impacted by and implicated in this, this uh, issue, um, they may be required to retest as the English II exam is required for uh, graduation. And so we'll await the decision and directive from uh, Mississippi Department of Education, but just want to flag that as a potential implication for those scholars. As well, our scholar um, support plans will be developed for all of the impacted scholars. We, um, we are especially mindful of our third graders, um, but really it's all of our scholars who um, may have been impacted by the uh, irregularities or the um, misconduct from this past spring. And so we want to make sure that all of our scholars have the kinds of supports that we do that proactively and that we ensure that, um, that they aren't um, um, the, a casualty of <coughs> the misconduct. Um, and tied to that, this last bullet here, scholars are, are uh, completing the beginning of year diagnostic exams. We give those every year. We call them universal screeners. We give those every year, and it's an opportunity to see where our scholars are at the beginning of the school year so that our plans for support and instruction and after school supports and anything else that we might provide to them, that it's um, based on data and that we can be as prescriptive and as specific as possible um, with those supports. And so um, that will be analyzed against or in comparison to the MAP performance and give us a sense of where there may be some misalignment in the two data sets um, and help us determine the appropriate supports for our scholars. As we've been um, conducting this investigation and just reviewing our, our practices and thinking about the ways that we can improve uh, test security, there are a few things that have um, bubbled up for us. The first is, um, while in, in high school in particular, it has been the practice that uh, the teachers of that particular subject do not test their own scholars. That's a, a common practice in our high schools, but not a common practice in our other schools, in our elementary and middle. 
there's just a lot to be said about scholars being in front of someone that they know and that they're comfortable with as they prepare to take a test that for some scholars they go in and there isn't that level of heightened sensitivity and, and anxiety and all that, but for several others, you know, that could be a really anxious, anxiety producing uh, time for them. And so um, we will be working to um, reset the way that we administer our uh, state assessment so that the homeroom or the, the teacher who teaches that particular subject um, is not the one testing their own scholars but doing so in a way that scholars are aware of and know and have some relationship with those who will be testing them so that the first time that they encounter those individuals is not at the testing time. And there are ways for us to do that. And so that's one of the major shifts that we, the team is already working to implement uh, starting this year and going forward. In addition, uh, just as we do at the start of the school year, we will implement a superintendent's hotline for anonymous reporting of any issues. We certainly don't expect there to be future issues of this type, but should there be questions or concerns or anything that just doesn't quite seem or feel right, we want to make sure that individuals know that they've got a place here in the district to contact us um, and, and share that information with us in ways that we can act on it and address any concerns that there might be. Uh, we also want to make sure that, um, as should be the case, uh, but that going forward that we ensure that we collect and consolidate and review uh, all of the test security plans for each and every school um, and that that information is submitted to the Mississippi Department of education as directed, as expected, um, and that if there are any issues early on, those things can be addressed, um, perhaps even before we get to uh, the testing um, uh, program. And then lastly, uh, at the impacted schools, we want to ensure that there's enhanced training and monitoring uh, to ensure test security. We fully expect, as we have over the last several years, that we will continue to see progress, that we'll continue to see increased uh, academic achievement of our scholars. And, um, and we don't want this incident um, from this year or this past year to completely sully the work of so many uh, educators and scholars throughout the, the district. And so um, we want to be a bit more targeted with the enhanced training and monitoring, even as we implement those other strategies throughout the district. Um, I'll, end with, I'll end with this and see what questions you might have for me, board members. Um, as we've reported previously, the, these are as, as egregious, as concerning, as serious as these issues are, um, they are located in uh, seven of our schools, four of which are located in um, and, and isolated in a particular grade and, and or subject. It is not a district-wide issue. Um, and we stand on that. And our data and our investigation have, have um, you know, revealed and, and supported that. At the same time, um, we're very concerned that this happened anywhere in our district. We have, um, we believe very strongly in our responsibility to move children to high levels of performance. We believe very strongly in that, and we, meant, we don't mince words about that. In this district, we will achieve at high levels. But we, we say that and we believe that um, while also believing that we have the capacity to do that and that our scholars have the capacity to achieve at high levels and that we don't need to cheat. We don't need to skirt the lines or, or blur the lines or any of that in order to get ahead. Um, and frankly, uh, you know, I really wish we could talk about our uh, other test data that, that is not implicated in any of this to, as proof, as absolute proof that so many of our scholars and educators are winning. They are achieving at really high levels and continuing to see that trajectory of growth in this district. And so we've got proof that we don't need to act 
um, outside of the guidelines and the requirements in testing. And so um, I'm really disappointed that, that uh, some of our folks chose to behave in this way. Um, we believe that we're sending a signal today that we will uh, manage and address misconduct. Um, but I hope that we're also sending a strong signal that um, for all of those people who do the right thing, have done the right thing, continue to do the right thing as it pertains to serving children, let alone testing, state testing, um, that we stand behind them and, and support them. I'm going to get off my soapbox here and, and see what questions you have for me, board members. Thank you, Dr. Green. Board members, questions, comments? Um, yeah, yeah, I've got a few. I'm, I'm going to try and pare this down. But um, one of the first questions that I had, you, you kind of touched on the impact on scholars. Um, and I, I just wanted to follow up and ask a quick question on that. You, you mentioned that they may be required to retest. Is that MDE's decision alone? Is there any JPS consequence to any of the students? No, we will. We have not determined any um, any JPS consequence to to scholars. Um, that 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 retesting of high and again that's just for high schoolers, yeah. um, and just for those um, who have been flagged, whose tests have been flagged, that would be a, an MDE um, consequence decision. Um, my next question is is a little bit more clarification, just so. I feel like I have a full understanding of what, what comes next, right? So I believe you said we submitted to MDE this afternoon. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, so do we have information on what their process looks like? Do they Are they going to tell us whether they take in and agree with our process, whether we have to go back to the drawing board and continue? What, what are the next steps as far as we know them from MDE's side? Yes, as I understand it, um, the first determination from MDE is whether or not they believe from what we've submitted that our investigation was comprehensive and um, solid, uh, and whether they need to do any further investigation into the things that we've investigated. Um, and we, we feel really good about um, our investigation. We feel good about what we've turned over to them. Um, and um, frankly, the, the numbers of individuals implicated that we have taken action, uh, personal action with. So we feel good about that. Um, in, a, in addition to that, determining you know, their disposition with regard to our investigation, um, they, in the Office of um, Educator Misconduct, um, we've submitted to them what's called an Appendix C. Uh, it's a form where you report to th that office any misconduct. Um, and we've submitted that for all of our uh, team members implicated here, including those for whom we believe um, their actions justified a letter of rep reprimand. Um, because the reality is MDE does have the right to come back and say, well, you said it was this, but, you know, we want to um, put them on probation or take some other action with regard to their license. Right. So that's something that MDE will, um, will determine. Um, uh, MDE also has to, and I didn't mention this earlier, but um, in the information that we submitted to them, um, I submitted a letter uh, encouraging them to, um, to only address the, um, those scholars for whom, um, and, and I'm sorry, the scores, the individual uh, scores or tests for those scholars implicated in these irregularities. Not all of the scholars in that grade level or that subject area or that school. 
And this is really important because again, um, in, in, many ca in those four cases, we believe the end count, the number of those scholars implicated in these irregularities should not eclipse the work done by other scholars and other teachers in those schools. And so we wanted to make the case to uh, the Mississippi Department of Education not to invalidate all of the scores in those, in those schools. Um, unfortunately, we could not make that same argument with the other three schools. And so. Just I, as a quick follow up on that point. Yes. Are there, in those classrooms that are individual, are there, um, were all scholars in the individualized classes implicated or could you, are there ways to draw sort of bright lines to say, uh, I'm gonna just uh, by example, the left half of the room and the right half of the room. So are we cutting that finely? Or are we saying just, ex just exclude the kids that were in this class? Uh, no, we have specific scholars, spe specific um, student ID numbers, um, and the specific tests. So um, in, in most of those cases, I could flag in my math class, but not in my ELA class. So I meant so, within your ELA class, if there are 20 kids in there, correct. half? Understood, yes. So not necessarily all scholars in my ELA class right. were flagged, on, you know, only those that were flagged. And um, even if I'm flagged in ELA, I may not have been flagged in math. And so we want to be really clear that only in the subject um, and only for those individual scholars if it's the entire section of third grade math or, or you know, eighth grade ELA or not, only those numbers. Because the reality is, and, and a great example of this is um, Lanier High School where um, a, a section of all of the scholars who took the English two exam um, was implicated here and not all of the scholars uh, who took the English two exam. Okay, this is my last one, and then I'm gonna be quiet. Um, you talked about kind of one of the corrective actions um, or, or sort of the shifts that we wanna see is the, is the sort of preparation, early prep of the test plans, the collection of the test plans, sort of focusing in on that front end review what what do we do on the back end to verify compliance with what they said they were going to do? Um, that just strikes me as one of those things that we may have the opportunity to say, look, nothing may show up in the data and we still don't like this. You know, um, And so I guess that's one of my questions is, do we have a procedure in place after the test is over to go back to that test plan and say, did you actually do it? We, we do a review and there are, um, uh, I'll say irregularities, but not in this sense. There are, there are issues that come about because the, because the um, internet was down and we had to test in a different place or at a different time or because this teacher was sick today and could not administer and so we had to sub in someone else. Um, but those are the kinds of things that are then updated on the plan and then provide it. Um, beyond that, I actually don't know how much more we're able to, to know. Until we get some data to say, hey, there's an issue here, like we, you know, we do what we can on the front end, but then once they've taken the assessment, um, then we get some data, we, we could get some data back to say, hey, there's an issue in this class on this day you know, with these scholars, um, look into this. Um, the, I, I will tell you that um, many of our school um, leaders in particular, but, but people in general around the district um, have been taught and understand very clearly not to be engaged in the testing if they're not formally engaged in the testing. So not in the area, not going into classrooms for any reason to bring something or to support a teacher or any of that sort of thing. There's such strong test protocols um, that the vast majority of people understand and follow that um, when you have those 
abnormalities, um, they, they should show up. Uh, I will say, in addition, you know, we've committed to um, rethinking how we staff schools uh, from the central office and, and others to ensure that um, we just feel confident that people are, are showing up as they need to and, and should. Um, you mean staffing for the test day? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. As additional hallway monitors um, and that sort of thing. Any other questions, board members? <laughs> um, do, do you use outside uh, persons for testing? You know, maybe uh, when I say outside people, uh, retired persons been require them to be trained. So uh, we have used them, um, but typically only as a hall monitor or a supply, someone to help with supplies or candies and that sort of thing. There's a lot of just all the cultural stuff that's done around testing to help scholars to feel at ease and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, someone may be used as a proctor and if so um, not as a test administrator um, i don't believe we would use any um, one external um, but as a proctor even still they would have to be trained yes by the test coordinator mm -hmm. on you know just what you can and can't do um does the state have persons coming around during the testing they yeah. To monitor? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, they have before, and we will be inviting um, even more, but they've already indicated that more will be, uh, especially in those schools, these um, implicated schools. And frankly, I want them to, um, because I, my, my hope and my expectation is that we'll move on um, and we'll have an opportunity to display um, integrity and, and test security, and I want them to see that. Mm -hmm. I want MDE to see that of our people. Mm -hmm. Mr. Figures or Mrs. Thompson, any questions, comments? They unmuted. Okay, thank you, Mr. Figures. I believe you said not at this time. Okay. Um, I do have several questions. Um, Dr. G well, yeah, we'll start here. Um, Dr. Green, in your presentation, you referenced Standard 16. Standard 16 was initially flagged um, when the district was almost taken over as a, a standard which we had failed. Yes, sir. In December of 2022, we received a report at the board level that we had cl cleared standard 16. And the very first instance we have to perform on standard 16 with testing, we failed. What happened? What happened then or what happens with standard 16? Well, I mean, so, I mean, the, the investigation, I, I, I have a lot of confidence in the investigation that you and your team conducted. So we know what happened. Yeah. I, I want to spend time at, at the leadership level. Um, and so this is really about, you know, we received a report that this was cleared. And then it, it's raised questions for me, should it have been cleared? Um, how many of the other standards have been cleared where can we trust that the other standards that have been cleared have actually been cleared or are there going to be findings that pop up again? Yeah. Uh, fair question. So a uh, couple of things I'll say to that. We, we hear from the Mississippi Department of Education periodically about two students. Um, here and there where there may be irregularities with similar timing or, or right to wrong answer, wrong to right answer, um, changes and that sort of thing. 
Um, and those are addressed as super isolated incidents with no indication or suggestion that there's something larger happening in that classroom or, or beyond that classroom. Um, so while this isn't the first time that we've gotten some testing irregularities, and, and what I'm told is that this is not uncommon you know, in testing, it's certainly not uncommon in my experiences in other places, um, to this l degree of irregularities and then upon investigation, misconduct, um, this is um, uncommon. Um, I have to believe that um, that through the the data that we given the data that we received this year about irregularities, and this is not new. The Cavion system, forensics assessments, and and um, um, forensic forensic data of assessments, given the the level of data that was shared with us or indicated to us. Um, I have to believe that had this occurred at this level previously, that it would have been flagged, right? Um, again, you know, we, we have really strong, I, I still believe, really strong um, protocols. Those protocols were not followed um, in all cases. And so there's, you know, individuals in classrooms, there's individuals um, um, outside of classrooms who, you know, we've addressed. Um, with personnel action. Um, and so um, I'm not prepared to go back and, and question previous determinations that we've improved in this way. Um, I, unfortunately, because of this behavior, now the questions, of course, and, and, and um, concerns and um, distrust and all of that is resurfaced. and given your question, I do want to call out. And we will again receive this violation as a district. Um, and we're, we remain on probation um, and down to the last few issues to address there, but this will come up again. Um, I talked through with uh, members of the senior team at MDE kind of what happens next. Do we have, can this be cleared in this year? Because again, my assumption and expectation is that we will clear this again this year. That is being named as a result of this past uh, spring. We will have an opportunity to show up um, with improved practices, additional strategies for maintaining security and that um, we will not have this kind of, of issue again. Um, and, and I think that's the best I can respond to that. I, I, um, you know, what I've seen in terms of data from MDE, I just, I can't imagine that there were issues like this previously and it slid by them. Mm -hmm. The forensics that they've provided, which helped us to then go back and ask the questions and do the kind of work that several team members have done over the last two weeks, um, it, it gave us what we needed to go look specifically. Um, I just don't believe that um, this would have gotten by them even previously. No, that's, that's helpful. I mean, um, <coughs> You know, I've been thinking, reflecting on it from a board level, right? So we as a board approved the test security plan. It's a test security plan that failed. I don't know that we interrogated it other than to ask, has anything changed? And so, you know, I guess another question I would ask then is, um, you know, do we know where the test security plan failed? You know, I know there's been recommendations for things that Am I, are we getting? I'm not sure that you could really, perhaps you could talk about that in executive session, if, but I don't think you can talk about that in open session. Okay. Um, I do think it's a line of inquiry. Yes, sir. Um, you know, in terms of when the next plan comes before the board, that it reflects what we've learned, what, you know, across the whole district. Yes, sir. Thank you. For flagging that, yeah. and and I can tell you now it will. Those, those things that we've named, 
um, just having individuals to test scholars, um, administer the test to scholars that they have not taught um, um, provides an additional level of, level of distance between the teacher of that scholar, that subject, that grade level, um, and, and the test. That in and of itself is going to be huge for, for us. Um, and um, the additional monitoring. And, and so we'll be able to demonstrate or, or um, articulate that in the plans in a way that you can see them when they come back before you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just conclude. Um, I know that the actions that the board is being asked to take this evening are unprecedented, I believe. Um, certainly it, since we've all been seated. seated. Um, and I think it's important that we look at what happened to our scholars. Um, we lost belief in our scholars. We lost belief in ourselves. Every single one of us. Um, it's not. I'm, I'm not willing to say this is on the backs of, you know, 17 people who were terminated, three who were suspended, and 24 who were reprimanded. All of us bear some responsibility um, because our scholars are carrying this. They're walking around the city with this label. Um, and it's, it's a label that was frankly painted with adults, by adults. Um, and so we've got to fix it. Um, and so um, I also, the other thing I do also want to lift up though is there were thousands of scholars and thousands of teachers who did right. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because of the actions of the few we're not able to celebrate this moment. Um, but I believe firmly that we will achieve what we would have achieved this year and next year. It's just one more year. Um, and so I want to make sure that we don't close out this hard period, this hard time, without lifting up all of the work that went into getting us. The foundation is there, and we will move forward. So thank you, Dr. Green. Yes, sir. That's well said, Dr. Seabrook. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Hairston. Mm -hmm. I lost my script. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. All right. Well, now we um, are going to move on to information action items. And the first uh, action item um, will be uh, shared by Dr. Cormack. And this is the request to approve the recommendation to consolidate Witten Middle School with People's Middle School. Dr. Cormack. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Sivak, to Dr. Green, members of the Board of Trustees and our JPS community. In light of the staffing actions shared this evening by Dr. Green in the preceding presentation, uh, the administration is recommending the temporary consolidation of Witten Middle School with Peoples Middle School to commence on Monday, September 18th and continue through the 2023-2024 school year. Given the acute staffing challenges to the Peoples team, this consolidation, we believe, is necessary for three primary reasons. First, we need to provide equitable staffing for our middle schools. The unplanned loss of teachers at Peoples means that we would not have sufficient math or special educators to continue our instructional program. However, we have mapped the remaining staff at both schools, and this consolidation will allow us to meet the needs for both campuses addressing existing vacancies at both schools. The people's enrollment of 241 scholars paired with the Witten enrollment of 302 scholars can be accommodated at People's Middle School, which has a capacity for 650 scholars. Second, there are presently a number of restroom renovations and ongoing construction projects at Witten Middle School. The air is out in the main office suite and other locations on Witten's campus. These facilities challenges have been managed deftly by our team, uh, but would not be an ongoing concern at Peoples where there are no current construction projects. And third and finally, Peoples has the capacity for the additional scholars and staff. As a newer building, as Dr. Green has noted this evening, it can provide the comfortable amenities that our scholars richly deserve. As I mentioned before, the combined enrollment of the schools is 
543 scholars, which is under the 650 capacity for the People's Building. People's has been host to several other schools this year, including Van Winkle and Sykes Elementary, when air conditioning posed a challenge. Um, our Assistant Superintendent for Middle Schools, Dr. Chanelo Evans, has met with our two middle school principals, um, and they have begun collaborating to make a very smooth transition. They plan to utilize the second floor for Witten and bottom floor for People's Middle School, should this be approved this evening. The combined staffing for both schools will ensure coverage of all content areas without the need for substitutes and will uh, keep all educators teaching within their certification areas. Pending your support tonight, we will follow the following timeline to support, plan, and communicate the consolidation. Beginning tomorrow, we will host um, an extended leadership team meeting of central office departments, including many of our operational units, transportation, child nutrition, counseling, assets, and logistics, et cetera. Uh, we will also, um, Dr. Evans and I, conduct after-school meetings with the staff at Peoples and Witten. Additionally, parent notifications, sharing uh, this uh, board action and family meeting at Peoples on Monday, September 11th to answer and to entertain questions and concerns from our school communities. This week, we will also deploy boxes to Witten to assist with the move, should it be approved. A final determination about the permanent status for Witten Middle School has not yet been made. We are offering this recommendation to respond to the immediacy of the staffing issues and facilities challenges faced at this present moment. Transparently, however, the administration is conducting a wider facilities review of which Witten and other facilities are being evaluated. At this board's direction, we will continue this process, engage with our communities, and come back to you with a set of recommendations for building usage. Um, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Dr. Cormack. Board members, any questions? <coughs> Excuse me, Dr. Cormack. So the, um, the recommendation tonight is just for the upcoming school year. Yes, ma'am. The recommendation is to begin Monday, September 18th, to allow for two weekends of transition and movement um, of teachers and um, the supportive equipment and technology needed to conduct uh, class at Peoples through the remainder of this school year. Well, I just uh, wish you all good luck. This is a, a challenge. I know. Every mama and auntie <laughs> loves the school that their child is attending, probably. So we've just got to do all we can to make sure that um, when these two communities come together that we can just really support them in every way. And to that last point, Dr. Harrison, um, I'll lift up and remind everyone that um, Fortunately or unfortunately, we've had experiences previously um, similar to this, and so we've built some, I think, some strong muscle around supporting school communities to come together and helping uh, scholars and team members to come together and, and um, work together. It's a huge opportunity, as I understand it, for both schools because I believe there are um, vacancies at both schools. Um, that Witten had some vacancies as well. Yes. yes, so both Witten and Peoples uh, have vacancies, present, vacancies presently, uh, but the consolidations of staff will eliminate those vacancies and allow for us to, um, to do so in a way that um, will meet the immediate needs to ensure quality instruction through the remainder of the year. Um, speaking to that experience, um, you know, Bailey and Northwest, we've learned a lot through that experience. Um, Dr. Evans is uh, currently um, organizing some opportunities not only for scholars to um, build a cohesive uh, team, but also for our adult team members uh, who will be new to collaborating with one another um, over the next several weeks. So, Can I just ask some quick questions about what seem like distinctions between this and, and what we're doing and what we've seen at Bailey and Northwest in particular, since, since as a good example? It, this sounds like we're co-locating, we're not consolidating. Is that a 
fair question? Is that a fair statement? It's not. Uh, so, but it is a fair right. question. So, um, although although we would like to keep school cultures intact within the building, as a co-location would suggest, um, the staffing consolidation is necessary, and so we will be merging class lists. We now have experience with that at several of the schools where school construction projects are ongoing, where um, although a teacher may be designated as a teacher of record for Lake Elementary, there may be a complement of Pecan Park scholars on the roll. So we build a muscle around these shared class lists which <coughs> allow us to um, recognize the economies of scale of having teachers in the same building. And so it's beyond co-location. There will be some shared class lists um, to be able to recognize that. I was assuming that was true, but I heard you say that there were going to be one on one floor and one on the other. Yep. And, I just wanted and, to kind and of so a portion that of that is around um, maintenance of culture. Mm -hmm. You know, they have different school colors. They have, you know, mascots and whatnot. Teams. And so there's an opportunity to maintain some of that um, distinction. It's also where administrative offices and other pieces would be housed to try to delineate some separation. Uh, but in terms of scholar movement, um, that will be dictated by schedu new schedules that will be uh, created um, to recognize the staffing piece. Um, kind of to that point, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that I think are true and have you confirmed a bit that all the administrative staff from both places, there's no, not one principal over the top, you're going to have two principals on one site. That's correct. And uh, again, building muscle around um, shared administrative load, division of responsibilities and labor. We actually, I, I think, based on the initial conversations with principals, see this as a, a real opportunity. Um, there is an opportunity to realize and to really build supportive cultures where scholars can thrive and more adults and in the right positions to help to lead and steward that work. Um, and they're open to it. They, as I mentioned before, at, Nav at Witten have been navigating around the school construction site, um, essentially. Um, so there's opportunities to, to realize that, which, you know, unfortunately has added to the length of some transitions because of more or fewer restroom facilities. Those kinds of challenges won't be experienced. And so I believe both principals are on board with seeing it as an opportunity. They've talked about uh, building some key touchstones with, with, you know, some shared opportunities to build culture around um, their uh, positive behavior interventions and supports within the school, um, and really the reality to continue the continuity of instruction. Um, Dr. Evans and her team and support will um, cover those classes where terminations have impacted them over the next several weeks, and so there are opportunities for laboratory classrooms. We really want to pitch this as an opportunity to build a cohesive um, and continuity of instruction. So I've got two more kind of specific questions. Um, one has to do with the, this bridge period, right? So people were let go today. We're talking about uh, starting there September 18th. Can you shed some light on what's happening with those kids who saw their, who will not see their teacher tomorrow? Yeah. Um, what's happening within those classrooms? That's one of my questions. The second question I have is really specific to Witten. I'm going to guess I'm going to mess up the name, but it houses the I'll call it fast track, fast track program. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Um, is that moving to Peebles? Is that going to a different place? What's happening with that? Um, Great question. So on the fast track question first, fast track fast track will remain in place at Witten on the Witten campus. It's actually located on the newest. Uh, wing of the building and so it has fewer of those challenges and we don't want to shift or pivot that programming. We've already built the transportation modeling around it so it will remain there and it has its own intact administrative team um, and it has its own self-contained teacher units such that it's not necessary to stand up instruction or continue instruction at Peoples. Um, around um, the first of the questions, remind me quickly. Excuse me one second. Sure. Um, Dr. Cormick, for the public, can you please describe the Fast Track program? Yes, sir. Thank so you. Our, the Fast Track program is a new program to our middle school division. Um, it supports our uh, overage scholars who are two or more years um, behind their uh, chronological grade. Um, and so um, it is a program that we have built up. It's now housed at Witten Middle School. It's a district-wide initiative that supports 
um, scholars who uh, are in grades four through seven, um, and their schedule is designed such that they um, will receive instruction for two grade levels within a single year. Um, thus kind of putting them back on the track to, um, to graduate with their initial um, high school cohort. Thank you. The first question was what's going on um, with the classrooms where teachers right. are not going to be there tomorrow? Yeah. So um, the middle school division has a number of uh, academic coaches um, that support their work. And so those are all certified educators that um, support content area instruction around the division. They will be deployed to uh, support instruction um, at Peoples uh, where there are those vacancies. As well, we have our Office of Teaching and Learning and Dr. Smith and their team have committed uh, resourcing and staff as well um, to ensure continuity of instruction for those scholars over this bridge period. So starting tomorrow morning, folks will be out at uh, at Peoples to support instruction. And, you know, the good thing is these are some of our, our strongest teachers in the district. These are folks who have been tapped to coach and support other teachers. And so I um, actually appreciate that scholars will have access to these individuals, if only for this, this period. But, you know, this is a, if there's a time where you want to have that kind of strength and through these ta transitions, then that would be one of those times. And the good thing is we have built some of this muscle. Um, in fact, our academic coaches are frequently in buildings co-teaching and modeling instruction. So these will be familiar faces to many of the young people and we hope to um, be able to draw on that as a strength over this transition period as well. Other questions? I, I have a question. Yes, Mrs. Thompson. Yes, I um, am just wondering about also, um, I don't know, you know, uh, like when our children, I guess, misbehave or have challenges and give me some kind of trouble and they have to have some redirection type of lessons around their actions, is that something uh, that the students who have been involved in um, this, these, you know, uh, testing regulations can, can uh, I guess, benefit from, from the counseling point of view or uh, just being made aware of, you know, like what that, what that looks like, what the, uh, what the consequences was for that and, you know, like helping them to understand why these changes are being, uh, uh, made for them and you know so that the students can understand the magnitude of what what, what happened mm -hmm. on their level if that makes sense i don't know if i'm making sense at all but i just i just feel like i understand it and i think that some of the uh you know <laughs> community will understand it but i, I think our children got to have some kind of understanding on their level um, as well. And what provision, you know, for, for them, I, I understood uh, what uh, Mitch asked about the instruction happening, but also why, you know, like this happened with my teacher, she's not here, and this was a bad thing, and this is why it was a bad thing, and how can I help you know, because sometimes they'll feel helpless or they'll feel like they got people in trouble or, you know, take it upon themselves, the, the, the guilt of it all, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so much of what you said really resonates. I will say, um, having been part of the investigative team, um, one of the things that was very um, heart-wrenching were the student-level interviews. Um, and it was from the mouths of our scholars, um, things that they witnessed and observed that they knew clearly um, did not reflect the best um, of what other adults in the building who had operated with integrity, um, just it, it, it frankly wasn't the demonstration of our best. And I think many of our scholars were aware of that and, and told the truth and did so um, without 
any sense of um, consequence or respective persons, they told it. Um, and we're appreciative for them um, being very candid and transparent with us because it allowed us to be able to follow the leads where they, um, where they went. Um, so there are some individual scholars that we will certainly need to follow up with on the basis of what they share with us in interviews. And we will discuss as a team just the best ways to reorient the culture and to put our arms around all, all scholars, um, around adults behaving at their best, and uh, frank, frequent, frankly, um, frequent reminders around our genuine belief in a growth mindset, which Dr. Green led with, which is this idea that you know if we work hard, we can demonstrate uh, great progress and results, and how um, the action of a few adults did not demonstrate uh, a core uh, one of our core values. I'll just add to that, and thank you for that that question, um, Mrs. Thompson. Really appreciate you lifting that up. You know, we again, as Dr. Cormack has already stated, you know, we we've we've had some tough times uh, processing what our scholars have shared with us. Well, well, what all the folks shared with us, but specifically what our scholars shared. Scholars shared, um, and so uh, are certainly mindful of the need to uh, try to address that, and and also of the, the nuances. In this, and this is both with young people and with with grown-ups, um, you know, based on what what's sh what's been shared and and uh, some of the conditions and context and whatnot, um, we want to be want to be careful that the accountability is where it should be. Um, and even though, you know, as Dr. Cormack has already said, scholars were able to retell some things that clearly were not appropriate. Um, you know, we, we in, in addressing them, want to be careful, want to be careful not to assign any undue blame to them as in many cases they were acting under the direction of adults. And to the extent that that is true of adults as well, we're mindful of that. So um, the point is very well taken. Um, we'll, we'll need to give some additional thought to the, the, the right entry points and, and how to support and engage and allow space for scholars to come and talk to us, um, individuals and, you know, others, because likely the impact will be felt by many scholars who weren't directly impacted or implicated in this situation. So we're mindful of all of that. Other questions, Mrs. Thompson or Mr. Figures? I just have. Um, no, I don't have any. Okay, thank you. Um, recognizing the desire to, to bring the, the schools together, um, I know that the students started, that some students started the school year on football teams, on volleyball teams, on cheer teams. Are they going to lose that? No, sir. Um, all of the athletics and co-curricular activities will continue uh, unabated. Okay. Um, okay. That's helpful to know. Um, that's really the only thing. Other board members asked the other questions. Um, for ask for a motion, you know, obviously this is is not easy. Um, and I just want to thank the team for coming up with the solution. Um, and so I also um, want to express unequivocal support for Dr. Green and the team at this moment. And so we will get through this time um, and we'll interrogate it. We're going to ask the questions. Um, but I also don't want anyone to mistake this moment 
um, for something that it's not. And at the board level, Dr. Green, again, we, we support you in this moment. Second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Cormick. <coughs> Next, um, we have the request to approve the data sharing agreement between Teach for America and the Jackson Public School District. Dr. Cormick will also present this information. Good evening. Uh, the administration is recommending for uh, your approval tonight um, a data sharing agreement between Teach for America and Jackson Public Schools. Uh, this data sharing agreement and um, continuing professional service uh, agreement uh, will allow um, this continued partnership, which began in 2009 here in JPS with Teach for America, providing uh, core members to teach in uh, classrooms throughout the district. The data sharing agreement in particular um, will allow our partners to track um, the success and efficacy of our Teach for America core members serving in the district um, as they participate in a University of Chicago impact study um, looking at um, and evaluating their work. Um, in response to some of the questions uh, put forward by the board, um, Teach for America does provide professional development for our core members that aligns with our district professional development. Um, their training is primarily focused on supporting beginning educators with classroom management strategies and lesson planning. Um, additionally, this uh, kind of agreement is something that Teach for America is looking to scale up through its partner districts um, nationally and um, we'll provide additional information about um, the number of districts partnered um, once we receive a response from their general counsel. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cormick. Board members, any questions, comments? Um, thank you for the responses to the questions. Um, I think the main thing for me is just as we get the data in, it, it would be great to get a briefing at the board level just to, to see the, I know that we've had a long standing relationship um, with TFA. Yes, sir. All right, board members, is there a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. The mo thank you. The motion carries. Next, we have the request to approve the Mississippi Employer Assisted Housing Teaching Program Loan Agreement. Ms. Lyons, our Executive Director of Human Resources, will present this information. Great evening. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, Board President Sevag, members of the board. The loan agreement before you is between the Mississippi Dep Department of Education in conjunction with Fannie Mae and the teachers listed in board material. A maximum loan amount of $6,000 is available to an eligible teacher to assist in, the, in paying the closing costs of the home and the teacher must agree to render three years of service to the district. Based on this information, the Office of Human Resources is recommending approval of the Mississippi Employer Assisted Housing Teacher Program Loan Agreement for two teachers at the Com Park Elementary School. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Board members, is there a motion to approve this request? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Next, we have the request to approve the network partnership and I don't have my key in front of me. It's BEI, but I wanted to say what that was. The um, Black, Educator. Flash edu Black Educator Initiative. Thank you. The, um, the National Center for Teacher Residencies, the network partnership in the Black Education Initiative. Dr. Knowles will present this information. Good evening, Dr. Green, Board President CVAC, and members of the board. The administration is requesting approval of the Network Partnership Agreement and the Black Educator Initiative Partnership Agreement between Jackson Public Schools and the National Center of Teacher Residencies. By becoming a network partner with NCTR, Jackson Public School District can leverage the expertise and resources offered by NCTR to address key challenges in teacher recruitment, retention, and development. This partnership will not only enhance the quality of education provided to students, but also create a supportive environment for aspiring teachers to gain valuable experience and become highly effective educators. The network partnership with the National Center of Teacher Residencies for the 23-24 school year offers several compelling justifications for the Jackson Public School District. Thank you, Dr. Knowles. Board members, are there any questions, comments? 
Dr. Niles, uh, just one question, um, and I said it's the Black Educator Initiative. Um, what can you, is our hope that we will retain some of the student teachers upon completion of the program, and, and any um, any other work that, that we plan to do to um, retain yes, them? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. So the short answer is yes, and so. Uh, as you know, we started uh, last year our Male Educators of Color program here within the district, and one of the goals of that program is to find avenues and create opportunities to entice or recruit young male educators of color, particularly at the elementary level. The opportunity came along through the Black Educator Initiative uh, where we were able to receive a grant for $64,000, and so our plan is to be able to use those funds as a part of the BEI to be able to incentivize male educators of colors that are in the student teaching program with some of our partner universities, such as Jackson State University, to do their student teaching here. And if they commit to teach with us early, then they can receive a stipend and also participate uh, in a lot of the trainings and things that we offer our employees here within the district with the same goal of being able to boost the number of male educators of color that we have at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that update. Board members, is there a motion to approve the network partnership and the Black Educator and the National Center for Teacher Residencies Black Educator Initiative? I shall so move. Mrs. Thompson is moved. Second. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Knowles. Aye. All right, next we have the request to approve RFP 2023, the K-12 core curriculum, digital resources. Dr. Smith, our executive director of the Office of Teaching and Learning will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. President C. Beck, Dr. Green, members of the board. The, the Office of Teaching and Learning is presenting for uh, information action approval of award um, RFP 2023-14 digital print uh, K-12 curriculum resources for English language arts to um, McGraw Hill. And this is in, um, we will come back later with a, another uh, pending approval for uh, another company um, if the board agrees, but we do have um, McGraw Hill at this time for um, English language arts for um, middle and high school. Great, thank you, Dr. Smith. Board members, are there any questions, mm -hmm. comments? Dr. Smith, one question I had is, um, is this for the 2024, 2025? Are we doing it, are we buying, is this advanced? Are we, are we starting to bring in materials for the next school year? I hope to get to that point, um, Dr. Seabag, but right now this is like a renewal for this year. The agreement actually, if I'm not mistaken, expires around this time of October, so this will help us to continue with a uh, no break in service right now. So are there new, are, okay, are, are there new materials associated with this contract? No, it's a renewal of the um, materials that we've been using from, it was, it was study sync. McGraw Hill is our study sync provider. Okay, so we're, it's not a situation then where we're having to, well, effectively where we're integrating new resources in the middle of the school year? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Okay. okay. Um, very good, and so, the, okay. All right, board members, is, is there a motion to approve this request? All right, so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Ms. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the request to approve the job descriptions for network administrator and IT services administrator. This is Ms. Erin Mason, our executive director of information technology services. Good evening. Good evening. Um, administration is recommending the approval of two new job descriptions for the positions of Network Administrator and Information Techno Technology Services Administrator. These uh, new jobs for descriptions for the ITS Administrator and Network Administrator position better fit the job duties and responsibilities for the personnel we need at this time to fulfill these roles in the department. The job titles and descriptions better align with industry standard position titles and descriptions qualifications and the f actual functions of the positions in the department. 
and they are simply replacing um, an older job description and another job description that we've been unable to fill based on the requirements of the position. Great. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Board members, any questions or comments? Um, and it's my understanding that um, while, the, while the position description have been updated, there is not a change in the salary scale. Is that correct? That is correct, to my okay. knowledge. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Board members, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Hiller is seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> the motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Next, we have the request to approve the agreement between grade results and the Jackson Public School District for online and blended learning. Did I miss one? I did, I did, I did, I jumped. Uh, we have, okay, so this is the request, apologies. Um, I saw Dr. Moore coming up. So, uh, request to approve agreement between Define Learning and the Jackson Public School District to provide curriculum K-12 international baccalaureate programs. Good evening, Dr. Green, Dr. Sivek, board members. The administration recommends the approval of the memorandum of understanding with Define Learning and Jackson Public School District to offer international baccalaureate aligned curricular programming in IB schools for grades K through 12. Yeah. This partnership provides supplemental project-based and problem-based curricular modules which are aligned to IB standards. This agreement would be a strategic and systematic approach to supporting student preparation as early as elementary for success on the IB exam which occur at the end of the high school. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Board members, any questions? Is there a motion to approve? I have a question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, will this be aligned with the material that you get from the International Baccalaureate Organization? Yes, ma'am. That was one of the criteria for the district entering in with the partnership with this particular vendor. Uh, the IB standards are, and also the Mississippi curriculum standards are aligned in these project-based programs. So as teachers go in, they're able to pick those projects and also be able to indicate if those standards that they're addressing can be addressed with those. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess there's, okay. I'll ask you later. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask them now. You, you, you're the resident expert on the board on IB. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm ready to learn. Yeah, ask. <laughs> um, uh, are, well, how do I want to ask this question? Nobody knows, huh? <laughs> uh, yes. now, are there um, curriculums that are presently being used in the district with this program? With the program? The curriculum that the district is basically used, this is the one of the reasons why this program was, uh, was being sought out to be used. Mm -hmm. uh, it provides the teachers an opportunity to be able to uh, identify projects, especially IB curriculum. A lot of those mm -hmm. project-based learning teachers had to come up with them on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, but this particular program, based on whether it's math, language, science, multiple units, they're able to also identify those projects already mm -hmm. aligned so they can be ready to use, adapt it to the students. Teachers also can adapt those lessons or build them from what's already located mm -hmm. there. I guess I was asking that question because I was concerned about the um, number of students who are actually earning the diploma. And I know that in order to earn that diploma, you have to, they, they have to follow the curriculum that is published by the International Baccalaureate Organization. Um, so I was wondering if teachers who are teaching the, the classes now, whether or not they are being provided with um, uh, materials, workshops, and that kind of thing uh, that will prepare them for preparing the students to do well on these exams. 
And I think that was the approach uh, to ensure that this program, we got something that started the elementary as well. So this program, it's not just a middle or high school uh, mm -hmm. initiative. It's going to happen also at the elementary level, as well as our office has also worked this collaborative with the Office of Teaching and Learning this year to mm -hmm. provide uh, professional development that's catered for IB. Especially mm -hmm. for this year, we're having two 60% professional development days and two 100% professional development days. Mm -hmm. And in those days, we're having training that supports the IB programming, their vertical alignment. Even I think even September 15th, next Friday, is one of our first 100% days. So mm -hmm. a lot of that training that's aligned just for IB, those teachers at Northwest and also at uh, Jim Hill are already planning to have a vertical alignment session that will be taking place. So there's a lot of different work that we're doing out of the Office of Advanced Academics this year to help support teachers in the IB program. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hilliard. Definitely appreciated the line of inquiry. I'll just, just appreciate the question and um, Dr. Moore's work and, and others, specifically around IB, AP, and um, those opportunities that we provide to our scholars for advanced learning um, and more rigorous learning and understand that, you know, just by our data, we know that we've got significant work yet to do. Excited to have more scholars involved in those classes and those programs, but also excited for these and other opportunities um, that, that we're lifting up to ensure that our scholars meet with greater success and not simply take the courses or the exams, but demonstrate increased performance on those, on the same. Thank you. <laughs> All right, board members, is there a motion to approve the agreement between Define Learning and the Jackson Public School District? I still move. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Ms. Hilliard has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you. All right, next we'll invite Ms. Marshall Thomas up, our Assistant Superintendent of the High School Division, to request the approval of the agreement between grade results in the Jackson Public School District for online and blended learning. Ms. Marshall Thomas. Great evening. Great evening. I receive back board members, Dr. Green, our JPS family. Um, the administration is recommending board approval of the online and blended learning MOU between grade results and the Jackson Public School District for the purpose of providing online and blended learning courses for credit recovery, uh, initial credit courses, professional development, on-demand tutoring, and also live virtual instruction taught by a Mississippi State licensed and highly qualified online instructor that will provide blended learning aligned with the Mississippi College and Career Readiness Standards as well as a new REAP Virtual Academy program that is an extension of our current REAP program to offer a dropout recovery program for our scholars ages 17 to 21 years of age. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Marsh Thomas. Board members, any questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Marsh Thomas, real quick, could you just share the um, schools that will receive uh, this um, program? In the, uh, it will be open to all schools, all seven high schools, including REAP, Capital City, um, also at our CDC, they offer CTE coursework. So all of our high schools and our middle schools have um, access to the great results program. As far as the virtual instructors at this moment, we, there are 16 teachers that we are requesting um, in courses that range from um, world languages to upper level science courses, physics, all the way up to um, needing the higher level math courses, algebra three, and those like. Great. Thank you. I just, again, I wanted to just share the, um, the breadth Correct. of ways which we'll be using it and also the, the breadth of schools that will we'll be using it as well. So thank you. Um, board members, is there a motion to approve this request? Motion. Miss, uh, excuse me, Mr. McGuffey has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Marshall Thomas. You're welcome. 
And she's here for the next one as well, the request to approve the agreement between the Microsoft Corporation and the Jackson Public School District for the TEALS program. Thank you again. The administration is recommending for approval the memorandum of understanding between Microsoft Corporation and the Jackson Public Schools. Um, under the terms of this MOU, Jackson Public Schools will participate in the Microsoft Philanthropies Technology, Education, and Literacy in Schools program which is designed to introduce computer science in schools. The TEALS program will pair trained computer science professionals from across the technology industry who volunteer their time to work with classroom teachers um, to team teach computer science concepts and skills. Currently, the implementation occurs in two of our courses. That's our AP Computer Science Principles course and our Computer Science Engineering courses. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Marsh Thomas. Board members, any questions, comments? I, I had one question. In the, in the responses that we got um, on to, to some of the questions that were provided, um, there were four schools listed under the, under the AP uh, classes. Is this program being provided across all seven high schools focused on those four schools alone? It's, it's actually all schools. Those are just the four schools that actually offer the AP computer science. So okay. if it's not offered in AP computer science, it's offered in computer science and engineering course. Okay. Yes, sir. Are you having problems getting volunteers for the program? No, we actually have really, really great volunteers. This is our fourth year um, of implementation and some of the same um, computer science gurus come back each year. They also help recruit other uh, members in their organization to come and, and assist as well. We just wish it could just be more, you know, all classes, because they, you know, they're still working their full-time jobs. Um, it's generally just one of, our four, one of our classes that they come to, um, but all of our students could really, really benefit from having um, that experience. Okay, great. And Mrs. Marsh Thomas, she shared some data. Um, how many how many students have participated in this program over the last four years? Over 500 students have participated over the last four, four years, including this current year. And um, last year, the passage rate for computer science uh, students enrolled in these programs. Well, the students are not enrolled in the TEALS um, pro courses. This the AP Computer Science Principles course is a separate course. Um, with a different set of curricular um, requirements. And so we had 162 students that were enrolled in um, AP Computer Science principals. And of course, we did not have any students that scored a three or higher on the assessment. Um, we did have some students that were very, very close. And so what we're doing is working with TEALS and also our AP Computer Science principals teachers and that's identifying like where are we really missing the mark um, for our scholars. And a lot of it is, you know, this being the, the first real computer science course that they've taken. So there's a lot of information that we're trying to, to get them caught up with. And so that's really causing, causing the lag. So with the new requirement, the state requirement with computer science, we're hoping to see an earlier start um, with computer science. Um, concepts and skills so that by the time those students are actually enrolled in AP Computer Science principles or just regular AP Computer Science, we'll begin to see more of our scholars scoring the three, fours, and fives. And, and good, good achievement inside the class as yes. well. At, that was the number I was going for, the 97 percent. Oh, yes. 97 percent of the students passed the courses, yes, so. which are really, really rigorous courses. And, and, and like all the other curriculum work we've been doing over the years, I got to think that the foundational work of the TEALS program will, yes. will begin to start seeing that yes, in later years. Um, so well, great. Well, thank you for bringing this um, before us. Board members, is there a motion to approve? I shall move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Dr. Harrison is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have the request to approve the agreement between Mill Creek Schools and McGee um, and the Jackson Public School District. Um, Ms. Bingham Gibbs, Dr. Bingham Gibbs, um, the Executive Director of, Ex of our Exceptional Education Services, will present this information. Good evening, Dr. Green, Dr. Sivak, board members. 
the Office of Exceptional Education Services is presenting for approval the renewal, renewal collaborative agreement with Mill Creek Schools McGee to provide an eligible child placement facility for students eligible for exceptional education services. The purpose of this agreement is to establish working procedures and pre provisions of services at Mill Creek McGee, McGee Treatment Facility for the districts eligible for special education services. Thank you, Dr. Bingham Gibbs. And I see also that you've got the next two items. Um, would you mind just working through those as yes. well? Um, Mill Creek, the next one is Mill Creek Schools in Pearl. Um, this facility is another uh, facility that's approved by MDE as an eligible child placement facility. Students served here at this facility are enrolled and placed by the school district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we have the um, agreement between the Mississippi Department of Rehabilitative Services. Um, the purpose of this MOU is to describe the terms which under, uh, under which MDRS and JPS will follow to provide a seamless um, transition from secondary school to post-secondary education, training, and or employment. Thank you, Dr. Bingham Gates. Board members, any questions or comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? I move that we accept uh, items presented by Dr. Bingham Gibbs, J, K, and L. Second. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Bingham Gibbs. Mm -hmm. Next, we have the request to approve the whole school's uh, grant for the 2023-2024 school year. Dr. Grigsby will present this information. Good evening, Dr. Sevak, board members, Dr. Green, and JPS family. I'm bringing forth for, the, for recommended action the approval of the renewal of the existing model whole school grant for the 23-24 school year at Casey Elementary. As you all know, Casey Elementary is an art school, and this grant allows the school to continue to provide arts integrated instruction to scholars and professional learning opportunities for teachers. Casey Elementary has been a part of the arts program since 1997, and we believe that the teaching strategies of arts integration have proven to promote student achievement by helping scholars to become critical thinkers through the arts. Great. Thank you, Dr. Grigsby. Board members, are there any questions, comments? Are there other schools that, in this case, are the only school that has the art program? Correct. So I, I think I, I'm probably going to be premature, but there are some things in the works um, in terms of other schools having access to the same mm -hmm. information. Yeah. There's, there's interest. <laughs> there's interest from other schools, and so um, we do, we're doing some pre-work to, to determine feasibility okay. and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent program mm -hmm. uh, for others to share. Yeah. You all do an excellent job of getting these grants and all of that, so just wanted to put that little plug in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hilliard. Board members, is there a motion to approve the model whole school grant for 2023-2024? I so move. Thank you. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Grigsby. Next, we have the request to approve the photography vendor list for 2023-2024. Dr. Merritt. Great evening to Dr. Seaback, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Green and JPS family. The administration recommends uh, that the board approves the recommended list of visitor vendors to provide uh, photographic services to various schools and locations on an as-needed basis for the 2023-2024 school year. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Board members, any questions, comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Ms. McGuffey has moved. Ms. Hood has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the request to approve an amendment to the agreement between communities and schools in the Jackson Public School District. Dr. Merritt. 
Yes, sir. So what you have before you is a request to approve the amended MOU between Jackson Public School District and Community and Schools. And what we are amending is the data sharing agreement. And it basically states that JPS does not uh, agree to any electronic agreements. All amendments to the agreement must be in writing. So we are uh, asking for approval of, of this amendment to the contract. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Board members, any questions, comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Uh, next, we'll move on to our consent agenda items. Uh, the consent agenda item finance um, has been reviewed by the board previously. We have an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda finance? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda item general. All consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? So move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda item personnel. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? The motion carries. Next, um, I do not believe we have an executive session. All right. So, board members, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. And have a great evening. That's wonderful. This event a success. Field Trip Friday is where we bring in students from all over the metro area. Select scholars are selected through their school districts. They get to attend this free field trip. We have up to 50 exhibitors today of all different types of heavy machinery, trucks, campers, and they're exposed to all types of career paths. We want to thank the Junior League of Jackson so much for inviting JPS out today. We're having so much fun. As you can see, my students are enjoying it. We're definitely going to have a lesson about um, the trades, truck driving, and firefighting and ambulance. We're enjoying ourselves, and we thank you all so much for inviting us. I believe that it is important so that the children will have a diversity in every entity so that they can grow up and know that they can be anything and achieve anything. Definitely getting them away from the uh, regular classroom environment, letting them know that you can learn anywhere and everywhere. So I can't wait to make this a lesson, definitely so they're able to just get outside of the classroom setting again and making sure that they enjoy their field trips, but also making them educational. This is so important because just this year in our 10th anniversary, we just heard a story about how a student from JPS who attended our very first year down at the state fairgrounds um, was exposed to heavy machinery by Lyle Machinery. They went on to be a diesel mechanic and they now work for Puckett Machinery. And so that tells us right there that what we're doing by exposing them to all of these different career paths and types of heavy machinery shows them that you don't have to do a four-year university, um, or you can, but there's lots of different options to have a quality life and make a good living. Jackson State University and Jackson.